So, um, yeah, thank you to the Neurological Foundation for inviting me to speak today. This, um, the research I'm going to be presenting is, is actually more of an um, introduction to a new research project that we have just established at the Centre for Brain Research in Auckland. Um, it's very much a passion project for me, as, and you would have heard from the intro there, I'm a, I'm a nice hockey player. And I'll, I'm going to kind of talk a bit about my background and why I'm particularly interested in this, um, this topic and, and understanding what's happening in the brain to cause dementia and, and contact sport athletes. And particularly, um, I'm talking about this disease called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which I'll refer to as, as CTE. So this, uh, this project actually sort of started off in, in May this year. So it's very new. Um, I would have liked to have presented some data to you today, but um, because of the COVID lockdown, I haven't been able to be in the lab to, to start all the work off. So this will be um, covering a bit of the background of what we know about this disease and also um, what I'm gonna be doing in this project. I'm just gonna make sure I've got a pointer up here as well. There we go. And my slide doesn't want to change. There we go. Okay. So um, just by a bit of uh, by way of introduction, just sort of a little bit about me. Um, the I'm a research fellow um, at the Center for Brain Research. So I'm a, I'm a sort of a working scientist there. And the the theme of my research is that I study neurodegenerative diseases by fluorescently labeling human brain tissue. So I study uh, brain tissue donated from from human um, brains. Uh, from Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, um, Huntington's disease, and, and now moving into um, CTE. The other thing about me, which is very much relevant um, to this new project, is that I'm an ice hockey player. So I also play inline hockey, which is, uh, it's, it's sort of like ice hockey without the ice, essentially. It's, it's, as you can see, it's on rollerblades, but otherwise very similar. Um, and I've played these sports for, oh, for a very long time, probably, um, nearly 20 years now. So I, I play a contact sport myself. So um, I'm very much sort of looking at myself and my teammates when I when I think about um, how CTE could affect um, the New Zealand population. So people are always going to ask me about this sort of hybrid life of um, athlete and scientist. And so I, I sort of just quickly touch on how I, I got to study this particular um, project. And so I started my, my sort of science uh, degree at the University of Auckland. I did biomedical science, which is a broad um, human body kind of um, specialization. Uh, at the same time, I was playing inline hockey for New Zealand. So uh, we were playing in a series against Australia every year. And this was a point in my career where I realized that brains are just the best. Um, I had a, an amazing lecture by Sir Richard Fall, and he was very inspiring. And this is the point where I really realized that brain research is where I wanted to be. And so I did a postgraduate honors year, which is a one-year research program. Um, that was with Sir Richard Fall's um, team, and we were looking at a sheep model, Huntington's disease. So we were trying to understand if this, um, the, the sheep that had been genetically engineered to express the Huntington's disease gene actually had the disease. And that gave me a taste of research. And needless to say, I really enjoyed it. So I signed on to do a PhD, um, which is sort of like a science internship, really. It's four years of um, conducting your own research with the guidance of a senior mentor. And for me, that was... Um, Professor Morris Curtis, who is the Deputy Director of the Human Brain Bank, and also Sir Richard Ball. And in this time, I studied this concept of plasticity, so the ability of the brain to adapt and change. And I was studying that in Alzheimer's disease. So to sort of summarize what was about four years of research into one sentence, what I found was the Alzheimer's disease brain actually has a lot of the capacity to regenerate. It just can't do it at the same rate that would allow for the brain to actually heal itself. So um, I had a sort of quite a broad understanding of Alzheimer's disease from my PhD work. And at the same time, I was representing New Zealand in ice hockey and inline hockey um, at World Champs. And so I was traveling um, around the world sort of back and forward um, to, for sport and training and also for, for PhD. So after that, I did a postdoctoral fellowship. And so that was funded by the Health Education Trust. And they have been incredible supporters of me doing something which is a little bit different. Most postdoctoral fellowships would be in one institution and you're essentially still training, but you are a working scientist. Um, but for me, I did this across two institutions. So I actually spent time at the National Institutes of Health in Washington, DC, which is the US government federal research um, uh, institute. And it's, it's an incredible place to do science with 
a lot of amazing people and amazing technology. And that's where I learned uh, some of the techniques I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Um, at the same time, I was coming back to New Zealand. So I was going back and forth between New Zealand and USA. I was used to a lot of travel and I was already traveling for hockey. <laughs> And um, I was bringing that technology back to New Zealand. So I set that technology up here and I'll talk about that. That's um, the fluorescent labeling of brain tissue, which is the crux of this entire project. So during this time, I was studying um, the sense of smell and Alzheimer's disease because um, interestingly, a lot of people with Alzheimer's disease experience loss of the sense of smell very early, long before the memory symptoms occur. We were trying to understand what was happening in the olfactory bulb, the part of the brain involved in the sense of smell and Alzheimer's disease. And so, um, of course, this was just before the pandemic and I came back to New Zealand um, frequently and in 2019, uh, the Sports Brain Bank Initiative was launched. So it's a couple of years ago now that this initiative was actually launched and we had uh, speakers from uh, around the world come in to this launch and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And at that point, I realized that what I had been learning and studying with Alzheimer's disease, human brain tissue was gonna be really applicable to being able to contribute to our understanding of CTE. And so that's where the sort of the seeds of this project started. And then of course the pandemic happened and I happened to be studying the sense of smell and everyone wanted to know why we were losing our sense of smell with COVID-19. And so I got kind of seconded into this project that was uh, looking at that. And then in 2020, I came back to New Zealand and in 2021, I was very generously funded again by the Health Education Trust to further my research studying um, CTE and the, the form of dementia that's associated with repetitive head injury. So it's been a bit of a process, but the underlying theme of my research has been consistent throughout this whole time. And it has given me an understanding of quite a few different neurodegenerative diseases and the processes that might be occurring in CTE. So that's kind of the background to how I got here. Now to introduce CTE, I have this um, really nice little two minute video, um, which really covers off a lot of the, the general um, knowledge of what we, we currently know about CTE. So I have hopefully enabled this in a way that we'll be able to, um, everyone will be able to see it. So, so hopefully someone can flick me a comment if it's not working, but I'm pretty sure this should work, so. Lately, it's been difficult to talk about football without mentioning concussions. Why? While well, mounting concern over a disease called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, more commonly known as CTE. In the world of medicine, CTE is a relative newcomer. In football, we just learned about it 10 to 15 years ago. Here's what we can say. It's a progressive degenerative brain disease. It is like Alzheimer's. It can start with memory loss, mood swings, and difficulty in concentration, developing into progressive dementia, even possible thoughts of suicide. But unlike Alzheimer's, CTE can also result in significant aggression and lack of impulse control. The big difference, symptoms tend to begin much earlier in life, closer to your 40s instead of your 60s. In both diseases, there's no known cure. Researchers believe there's only one way to get CTE, and that is repeated hits to the head. What happens is that you get a buildup of an abnormal protein called tau in the brain. Scientists do know both the location of the tau and how much tau in the brain determines the symptoms you might exhibit. But scientists don't yet have a magic number of hits that results in CTE. It also isn't known who exactly would develop CTE. There are some players who take many hits and never develop symptoms. Factors like genetics and age of exposure to the trauma could play a role. How do you know if you have CTE? Just because you have symptoms doesn't mean you have the disease. In fact, as things stand now, you can only be diagnosed for sure after death. Scientists are researching how to diagnose in living people. A prominent group of researchers have found over 90% of former NFL players have developed CTE. But remember something important here. The number could be so high because of something known as selection bias. That means the brains that were studied were from people who worried that they had CTE. Also, it's not just football players that need to be concerned. Boxers, soccer players, people in the military, anyone who's exposed to constant head trauma can develop it too. So hopefully that all played well. I didn't get any comments that suggested it didn't. It's kind of hard in these talks sometimes to know if everything's working, but um, some of the take home messages there that I kind of wanted to just reemphasize is that um, one of the main issues with CTE is that we actually don't know if someone has the pathology until after they pass away and we examine the brain. And that is obviously not particularly helpful for people who are living with the, the um, disease. And that's, that's quite um, a challenging thing that we 
we need to address in this research. We need to find markers that are going to help us identify this pathology in living people. And so that's one of the, the real areas that um, CTE research needs to move into. The other thing to point out is that a lot of the research that has been done on brain tissue, on human brain tissue, has been done on um, NFL players or American football players. And so a lot of our understanding about what's happening in the brain is actually based on a very specific population of people. And it's really important that we understand um, whether this is actually happening in the kinds of people, or the kinds of sports that we're playing here in New Zealand. So I think we need to be a little bit careful when we try to extrapolate knowledge from a very limited population. And so that's really the crux of why we want to do this research. The other side of it is, um, as the, the mentioned in this video, um, the most likely cause of this pathology, CTE, is repeated hits to the head. So not necessarily concussive hits or hits that will, um, head impacts that will cause the symptoms that we call a concussion, but just repeated head impact and exposure to head impact. That's really the, the defining um, characteristic of, of what we think is different with CTE and other forms of, of dementia. So oh, I'll just go to the... Here we go. Uh, so why, why is this important to me? Obviously, I mentioned I'm an ice hockey player. This is um, very personal. This is a, a picture of my uh, of the ice ferns, the New Zealand ice ferns, the New Zealand women's ice hockey team. Um, this is from, I think this is from 2019. We went to Romania. We won a silver medal in the Division Two World Champs. It was an amazing time. You can see how happy we are. But just um, when I look at this picture, I also see um, there are about a third of the players in this picture here have actually experienced a concussion or repeated concussions that have been so bad that it's taken them out of the sport for more than sort of six months. And it's affected their, their life, um, this, you know, not just their sport, but their work and their study. And um, this is my family. And so I get a little bit emotional because it's, you know, this is a disease that I worry that my teammates will, will get down the line. And so um, that's why I want to do this. The other reason I, as I've been doing research um, around this, I came across this graph, which is actually, it's about the rate of concussion in contact sport, uh, collision sport um, in college athletes in America. So not all the sports are on here because it's just US college athletes. But I remember reading this paper and I realized that this bar here, um, this is me, women's ice hockey. And our rate of concussion was up there with men's ice hockey, men's wrestling. And then this bar here is men's American football. And it was quite an eye-opening moment for me when I realized, you know, women's ice hockey is um, non-check, which means that we don't do the same hits that the men do. And it is a contact sport, but it's not supposed to be quite as, um, I guess, violent as the men's game. And yet our rate of concussion is still really high. And so this kind of made me realize that it's not just the sports that people would um, typically associate with uh, repeated head impacts, you know, like American football or rugby. It can also be some of these other sports um, where concussions are very frequent. And so CT has been in the media quite a lot recently. I've just kind of got a few snapshots here. There's been um, quite an interest in trying to understand whether or not, um, particularly in the rugby codes, whether or not people, um, uh, former rugby players might be experiencing CTE. Um, there has very sadly been some instances of players committing suicide and CTE has been found in their brain, which is what happened here in an Australian football player. Um, and in New Zealand, we've had uh, recently, there was this uh, the story that was aired on the Sunday show where they talked about, um, they interviewed Jeff Old and um, Ben Afiaki about their, sorry, just take a drink, <laughs> about their experiences with concussion and their long-term effects and their worries about their experience in the future. And so um, it's very topical in New Zealand. We've had former All Blacks talking about donating their brains to our research so that we can better understand CTE from a New Zealand perspective. And then we've put in some, um, some media recently. This is an article that was written about the research I'm going to present today. And then I was on Breakfast TV a few um, months or two ago talking about, you know, what we need to be doing in New Zealand to sort of contribute to this research. So um, to go into now a little bit about what we know about CTE, with the caveat that most of this work has come from the American football players. <clears throat> you would have seen in that video that we um, he outlined very well that the main pathology that we, we talk about is this tau protein. And what happens is we get this, these abnormal clumps of this tau protein accumulating in the brain. 
And what's interesting is that the tau protein that is accumulating is the same tau protein that actually accumulates and goes wrong in Alzheimer's disease and other types of diseases like frontotemporal dementia. So all of these diseases um, are actually linked by the abnormal accumulation of this tau protein. So in this microscope image here, it's these dark uh, brown swatches, which are inside brain cells. Um, but the difference with CTE is where the tau is accumulating. So it's in the, the earliest stages of CTE, it's the tau is accumulating around blood vessels. This is actually a little blood vessel in this microscope image. Um, and it's accumulating around these blood vessels in the, the depths of the folds in the cortex. And so um, these areas called the sulcus, um, the cortical sulcus is, is where the tau accumulates. Um, but in the earliest stages, you can get a tau accumulation, but no symptoms. Then uh, these tau lesions, they start to grow and spread. They move to further um, areas, the, the depths of different cortical sulci around the brain. Most of them are in the frontal lobe. And you can see that there's more tau here. There's more of this brown accumulation happening. And at this stage, we see symptoms such as rage, impulsivity, and depression. Then stage three is classified as uh, the tau protein moving into this part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is involved in learning and memory. And the, the, the movement of, of the tau into this area is causing brain cells to dysfunction here, and that leads to symptoms such as confusion and memory loss. And you can see in the microscope image, there's a lot more tau here around this blood vessel. Then in the last stage of the disease, it's classified by advanced dementia. And you can see that the accumulation of this tau protein has gone all through the brain. It's no longer just in these folds, it's also along the edge of the cortex in um, much more widespread. And you can see there's just a very, very dense amount of tau. And what we think is happening is that this tau protein is, is accumulating inside brain cells and the important brain cells called neurons, which are talking to other parts of the brain in your body, are becoming dysfunctional because they're just clogged up with all this abnormal tau protein. And so that's one of the main ideas around what's actually happening in CTE. So what do we know about CTE and sport? Well, again, this is based from American football studies, but we know that the severity of the CTE correlates with the level of American football play. So that's whether the person was playing at a high school or a college level, or if they're playing semi-professional or professional um, sport. Uh, it also correlates with the duration of their playing career, but not with the number of concussions or the position that they play. And you might think that this is strange that it doesn't correlate with the number of concussions, but remember that concussion is uh, a sort of a set of symptoms that we associate to a head impact. So it's not necessarily um, accurate representation of the number of head impacts the person might have experienced because there are plenty of athletes who won't report a concussion. I've done this myself because you know you want to keep playing um, or because um, the head impact hasn't been severe enough to cause the sorts of symptoms that we would classify as a concussion. But it is this, this repeated exposure to head impact which seems to be correlated with the severity of the pathology in the brain. As you can see in this little video here, um, I think this illustrates quite well how an impact to the skull actually causes a lot of movement in the brain. And that movement in the brain causes a lot of damage as it, as it hits the front and the back of the skull. And we think that that, that physical force against the cortex of the brain is, is causing some of this tau accumulation to eventually start to happen. So what else do we know about CTE? Well, I presented a very sort of straightforward picture, but it is actually very complicated. So uh, CTE tau lesions are often occurring with other types of pathology in the brain. So while the tau is the way that we classify a case as being CTE or not, it's quite frequent to see uh, cases present with other types of pathology like beta amyloid plaques, which is usually associated with Alzheimer's disease, or TDP43, which is another protein which is associated with motor neuron disease. And we can quite frequently see that these pathologies all together, and that can make it difficult to tell whether the brain that you're looking at is a case of CTE or a case of Alzheimer's disease or something different. So 
it's important to realize that as people get older, there is a natural accumulation of some pathology. And people are, you know, your brain is a representation of an entire lifetime. And so there's lots of different things that are happening in the brain. It can be quite hard for us to tell whether something is CTE or not. The other thing that we know is that the tau that we see in CTE is different to the tau that we see in Alzheimer's disease. So this is a picture, of a microscope picture, where you can see in CTE, the brown um, clumps here of tau, they're at the top of the image here. This is um, the edge of the brain. So actually in CTE, the tau accumulates towards the, the outer surface of the brain. Whereas in Alzheimer's disease, the tau is predominantly accumulating in the deeper parts of the, the cortex. And so there are sort of different parts of the brain which are being affected by tau in these two different diseases. So it's very interesting that you have the same protein going wrong in a different way and causing two potentially different diseases. One of the other things that we know is that the white matter of the brain becomes damaged. And so what I mean by that, if I just show you this little uh, picture in the corner here, you see around the edge of the brain, there's this dark, this darker layer, like a gray, it's the gray matter, we call it. And this is where the brain cells actually reside. And then you have this whiter area on the side here. This is the white matter, and it's actually the tail of all those brain cells coming down to talk to other parts of the brain, feeding off into other areas. And so what we know in CTE is that uh, this density of these, these tails, these, these tracts to other parts of the brain is a lot less dense. And so this is a normal and the blue is um, those fiber tracts and in CTE you can see it's a lot less um, intense. So it's a lot uh, lighter, there's not as much um, connectivity between these different regions. The other thing that we know is that there is chronic inflammation in the brain. So uh, this is a, a microscope image of some brain cells that are involved in inflammation. And they usually just cruise around the brain, um, cleaning up any debris, and making sure that nothing's in the brain that shouldn't be there. And if it is, they kind of engulf it and destroy it. Uh, and CTU, you can see that there are a lot more of them and they're very dark um, and they're quite big. And so this is kind of sort of the angry state. And you can, we can tell from this sort of morphology of these little immune cells that the, this brain is experiencing chronic inflammation. So we see this in CTE as well. Now, what we don't know about CTE <laughs> is a lot. Um, this is a very new field. And the, the type of information that we know about Alzheimer's disease, we don't know about CTE yet. And this is where a lot of the research is heading. So question, these are some of the questions that um, I'm hoping to answer. So are the blood vessels damaged? We saw that the tau is accumulating around the blood vessels, but we don't actually know if there's any damage to those vessels or if they're, they're functioning normally or if they're leaking and that's what's causing the inflammation. How widespread is the inflammation? A lot of the studies so far have just taken snapshots around the brain, but they haven't looked to see if the, that inflammation is actually focused around where the tau is or if it's just widespread. Um, are the neurons showing signs of stress? So that could be something like the, the brain cells might be there and we might be able to see them in the brain tissue, but are they functional? Are they actually doing what they're supposed to be doing or are they um, showing signs that they are not functioning properly? Are there different types of neurons that are affected by the tau? So the neurons are these brain cells that do the, the heavy lifting and the talking to other brain regions. And as we saw, the tau is actually located in different areas of the cortex. And so we're interested to see if there are different types of cells that are affected because of that different location. And then what is the role of all these other proteins? We talked, I showed you the beta amyloid and the TDP, but, but what impact does it actually have um, on the progression of CT? Or is it just sort of a bystander that we, we don't really know anything about? So these are some of the questions. They involve us having to look at brain tissue um, under the microscope and being able to look at lots of different things all at once. So we want to understand, we want to see blood vessels and we want to see different types of neurons. We want to see tau and other aggregated proteins. And so this is where the technology that I learned in America has come in. So our study is going to be fluorescently labeling human brain tissue to understand CT pathology in more detail. And it's funded by the Health Research Council of New Zealand and the Health Education Trust, which fund my salary. So our priorities, what we're trying to do is we're trying to compare the brain tissue of people with CTE, um, former athletes with from uh, rugby codes or, or New Zealand context, 
with Alzheimer's disease and normal aging. So we want to see what is different in CTE to Alzheimer's disease and normal aging. That could give us an idea of what we could look for in a living person with an MRI to try and distinguish these different um, groups. We also want to compare mild and severe CTE to understand what is actually happening in the disease to progress from an early stage to a late stage. And the overall purpose of this is to determine the pathological signature of CTE. We really need to understand what it is about repetitive head impacts which causes this type of pathology compared to what's happening in a different disease like Alzheimer's. And so these are the kinds of images that I generate in my work. So there are these beautiful fluorescently labeled pieces of brain tissue that um, I take images of under the microscope. So in this particular image, this is an example of the kind of things that we would look for. So in purple here, um, these are the big neurons, the ones that do all the talking to the other brain regions. In cyan, we've got some blood vessels here, if you can see those. In green, you see this big dense network of green, um, like a spider web. Uh, these are supporting cells called astrocytes and they actually look after the, the big neurons and keep them happy. Um, in red, we've got those little immune cells that I showed you before that um, scurry around and sort of clean up the debris. And so with a, with a technique like this, we're able to look at the brain tissue and identify different parts of the tissue and see how those different things are interacting. But traditionally, we've only been able to look at an image like I just showed you, so three to five markers at once. So what we're doing here is we're adding a tag onto the, the brain tissue, which latches onto a very specific piece in the tissue. Say uh, in this example, we've got um, some, some brain cell bodies here, and then we've got some of the tails uh, and then the green, and then we've got some blood vessels in red here. So I can only look at those sort of three things together. The, the work that I did in America was actually looking at how we can kind of supersize this so that we can look at more than a hundred different pieces, um, components of the tissue at once. And so in this situation, I'm able to look at a lot more different things all together on one piece of brain tissue. So in this example, I'm not just looking at one particular type of brain cell, I'm looking at a whole bunch of different ones. I'm not just looking at where the tails or the nerve fibers um, of those cells are, I'm looking at all the components of those fibers. And the same with blood vessels, not just seeing where the vessel is, but seeing all the layers of that blood vessel and whether they're intact or not. So this is a much more efficient way to do an, an anatomical study. Um, and it's gonna allow us to try and answer a lot more questions about CTE with um, a lot shorter time, but also um, more powerful because we're able to look at all of these different things all together on one piece of tissue. The other benefit of this work is that instead of looking at just one tiny, tiny piece of the tissue, we can actually see uh, the entire piece of tissue that we're looking at. So this is actually an example from the olfactory bulb, which is our, um, part of the brain involved in the sense of smell. So I was doing this work in America looking at Alzheimer's disease and this is the entire structure and you can see the context of all of the different parts of the tissue that we want to see um, all at once. And so this is actually the same piece of tissue but there are so many different fluorescent tags on it. Um, I can't put it into one image because it just looks like a rainbow. So I've split them into three different pictures but you can see the types of um, information that we can get by looking at all of these markers all together. Um, without going sort of too deep into the nitty gritty of how we do this, the, the technology essentially is taking brain tissue on, on, on a, piece of, a piece of glass, on a glass slide, and then we label it with these antibodies. And so it's the same kind of antibodies that your body would generate in order to fight off a, a piece of um, bacteria or something that gets into you. But these are antibodies that have been developed um, by commercial companies to specifically bind to a part of the tissue that we're interested in. So we can buy these antibodies commercially. Um, they've all been validated and we know that they specifically bind to what we want to see on the tissue. And then we add a secondary antibody that has a fluorescent tag. And the secondary antibodies will only bind to one of these particular primaries. And that means that we're able to label a lot of different parts of the tissue all at once with all these different fluorescent tags. I take it to the microscope and I take a, um, a nice image like I just showed you. And where the magic happens is what we can do now is we can actually remove all of those fluorescent tags off and add another round of them. And so before um, the original technology was would sort of stop at this imaging point, we would label it and we would image it. But now we can remove all of these uh, fluorescent tags. We can add more 
and we can take another image. And we can layer all of those images onto each other to produce a much more um, complete data set of, of information. So that's the general gist of sort of how, how this technology works. So coming back to the CTE project, uh, the, the really underlying infrastructure of this project is the, initi the initiation, was the, the start of this New Zealand Sports Brain Bank initiative, which is part of the Neurological Foundation Human Brain Bank. So the Brain Bank has been um, uh, operating at the Centre for Brain Research for, for many, many years, studying um, brains that have been donated by people who had um, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, Huntington's, stroke, um, motor neuron disease, all sorts of uh, different neurological conditions. Um, and now we're we're launching uh, a new wing of this, which is going to be receiving donations from people who have been have had repetitive head impacts in sport. And so the key for this, um, the criteria for this particular sports brain bank initiative is that um, the donors have had repeated head impacts. Um, and we're saying repeated because there are lots of different sports where you can have um, a single uh, brain injury, very severe traumatic brain injury. But for CTE, we know it's the repeated head injury, which is what is most likely to cause the disease that we're studying. And so uh, we had this launch, as I mentioned, in 2019. We had a quite an international cast um, turn up. We had um, Chris Nowinski, who's from the Concussion Legacy Foundation in America. And he uh, has established this global brain bank network um, where brain banks around the world are, are receiving donations to study CTE to feed into a, a bigger understanding of this disease. We also had um, Associate Professor Michael Buckland, who is from the Australian Sports Brain Bank. And he has been um, a really important collaborator for us to set up the procedures for um, the Sports Brain Bank initiative and also to help us understand what we need to be looking for in the tissue to identify CTE accurately in the donations that we receive. So, at the moment, um, we haven't had any sports brain donations received yet. Um, we are accepting registrations for people who would like to sign up um, to, to donate their brain uh, one day. Well, we obviously hope that you keep your brain for as long as you need it. But um, if you would uh, like to donate, then this is what the process is to contact um, this email address, brainbankerauckland.ac.nz, and um, you can ask, uh, that they'll give you more information about, about the process, about what happens, about um, all the paperwork and details that need to be done. And there's a little questionnaire as well about sporting history. So our collaborators are very important um, to get this project going while we haven't actually received any donations in New Zealand yet. So um, Michael from Australia has um, kindly provided us with some tissue from um, former rugby league players that uh, to start this project off. And then we will continue when we um, receive our donations into the Sports Brain Bank here. We're also um, in contact with the Boston University CTE Research Center. This is the, the brain bank that has done all of the, the seminal work with the American football players, and they have over a thousand um, brains that have been donated. Um, just sort of highlighting that um, the Australian Sports Brain Bank has uh, identified CTE in former rugby league and Aussie rules football players, um, and they published these findings relatively recently. And 2019 and 2020. Um, so this is sort of some of the evidence that we, we could possibly be expecting to see um, CTE in brains of former rugby players in New Zealand, um, although we haven't had a donation yet. And so, so this is where sort of the future directions comes in and um, sort of connecting with our audience and, and what we're trying to really set up here. So the this whole research program is really designed, um, well, I want it to be a, a sort of a person-centered research approach. And these are the three pillars of the Center for Brain Research. Um, the, the researchers, the community, and the clinicians all kind of working together to, to do research that is going to be impactful and useful to our community. So for, for this perspective, obviously our study on the neuropathology using this labeling approach to, to study um, what's happening in CTE brain tissue is the research side. We want to talk to the community um, people who are experiencing symptoms that they think might be CTE, obviously we can't diagnose it um, accurately right now. We want to understand people's experiences because the research that we do is really only made possible by understanding the life of the person who donated their brain has led. And we also want to um, contact clinicians and understand 
what is the landscape of CT diagnosis like in New Zealand? What is the patient experience and what kinds of information should we be looking at with our brain donation program? So all of these things work together. We're um, working with the AUT Traumatic Brain and Entry Network who are doing a fantastic job of this um, middle pillar here. They work um, with many community groups and are running up some incredible studies to try and understand um, the concussion kind of um, environment in New Zealand. And I mean, this is my mission. My mission is to use my expertise as a neuroscientist and my experience as an athlete to improve brain health of New Zealanders. And so I want to do this by using person-centered research and world-leading technology. So I've just shown you the, the um, tissue labeling, which is the technology. And this is how we kind of get it off the ground. So I'm, I'm looking to kind of understand from athletes and parents and coaches and clinicians and anyone in the community who wants to know more about um, this, what we see in the brain um, and the risks that are associated with repetitive head injuries in sport. I'm really keen to connect with Māori Pacifica communities to understand, you know, this is, this is research which is important for all New Zealanders and it's important that everyone is involved in, in this research and understanding what, what we're trying to do. So really keen to connect in there as well. Obviously we need brain donations. Um, so just letting people know that this is an avenue if you want to sort of support the science and sign up to donate. Um, down the line and funding. So this is a, a new research initiative. Um, I'm very fortunate to be funded through the Health Ed Trust for my fellowship. And we have some project money to get started from the Health Research Council, but I'm a team of one. So <laughs> it would be great to grow the team and, and really get this research off the ground and, and funding is what makes science happen in New Zealand. So um, with that, I think I would like to just sort of conclude by thanking uh, all of my collaborators, particularly my mentors, um, Professor Morris Curtis and Sir Richard Fall, who are also are the um, Human Brain Bank directors, Associate Professor Michael Buckland, who has helped us really set up this entire initiative here in New Zealand and has been um, a very willing collaborator for, for the project that we're about to get underway. Our collaborators at the Concussion Legacy Foundation, Boston University, um, NIH, who I still work with, and the AUT Traumatic Brain Injury Network, who are doing incredible work as well. So thank you to everyone, including all my lab colleagues, and I hope you found this informative. <laughs>